Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to teach from your scriptures. It's something I love to do. I ask, Lord, that you would forgive me for all the ways in my life that I've loved teaching the Bible and doing any sort of ministry more than loving you. Because all this other stuff in the Bible is meaningless without you. Everything is empty without you. And you want each of us to get our meaning and purpose in life from you and you alone. Not from anything else we can do or anything we're good at, but only from you. Thank you for all the things you give us. And thank you that you're faithful, even when we're faithless. I pray that you would increase our faith tonight. And that you give me the words to say. Even though I've prepared this, I ask that you change it however you want it to be changed. And lead us all closer to you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so, tonight we're talking about the book of Ruth, which the theme of which is redemption, um, which is definitely a very Christian word. So, for those who are familiar with it, can someone tell me in their own words, what does redemption mean? Um, to return an item to its original owner. Mm -hmm. Like if you uh, you had a gift card and you turned it in to get a movie ticket, that would be like redeeming the movie ticket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's true. We even use that with like coupons and stuff, right? Now to <laughs> redeem, redeem it. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is a very important part of it. In the Bible, I believe there's a little more to it than that. <clears throat> Excuse me. But... Yeah, that is a huge part of it. Any other thoughts on that? That's okay if not. To like save? Yeah. Save somebody from something? Yeah. Redeem in many ways is like a synonym for saving something that is either lost or is going to be lost. Hmm? So the book of Ruth is a story of redemption for the lost. And that is also a major theme in the entire Bible both Old and New Testament. Um, before we go further with Ruth, I want to give you guys an overview of the Bible's geography, so just the lands of the Bible and stuff with maps so you can see it more clearly. Sometimes I've drawn maps for you on the whiteboard, but I feel like this will make it easier. Um, so first of all, here's our world. There's another picture of our world, but not in space. And then there's, so you may notice this, See if my laser pointer will work on the screen. Maybe not. I guess not. I have a laser pointer, but it doesn't work on the screen. <laughs> okay, so. Did they usually work on the screen? I don't know. I don't know. But anyway. Um, <laughs> so, um, I guess I'll just stand and show you guys. Because so we live right over here, right? And um you didn't know that, we're over here in California, this is the United States, and this is the Americas. You know, this is like basic stuff, some of you might know. But anyway, this is the other side of the world, literally flip the globe around, and this is where everything we've been talking about takes place in the Bible. So this whole area, specifically right here, is what you're racing on. The Middle East, yes, today it's called the Middle East. Here's another map, it's flat. There's America over here, well, this is where we are, California. And then here's where all the Bible stories take place. There it is in a red box. So you can see it more clearly. So all these stories of the Bible that we're talking about take place right here, except maybe uh, Genesis chapters 1 through 11. Where is that? The very beginning. The whole world. Which, uh, oh, there, well, I'll show you in a minute. 
So this is another area I'm just really trying to show you from different angles. All the green areas that are highlighted, that is where the Bible story is taking place. And here it is again. Um, you can see the box on this map. And then here it has the modern names of the places. So Egypt is still Egypt. Anatolia, well, that's Turkey. Here's Turkey, Syria, Assyria, which is now Iraq. It used to be Assyria. Mesopotamia is now Iraq. Persia is Iran. Um, and then Israel is also called Palestine today. So the names of these places have changed, but it's the same place where the Bible story is happening. So what is this called, this area of land? Well, broadly, it's called the Middle East. Everybody knows about the conflict in the Middle East. It's where America was going and everything. But specifically, it's called the Near East by Bible scholars because if you look on this map, the Middle East includes areas over here. But the Bible story, the book of Esther takes place way over here. But other than Esther, most of the stories, and also some of Daniel takes place over here, but most of it's happening over in here, which is the near as opposed to the Middle East. And then the Far East is over in China. So that's why Near East. Okay. There it is again. I just drew a little box around it. So this little box here of the Near East is called the Levant or the Promised Land. There's different names for this area, uh, but it's basically the Promised Land, the land that God promised to Israel. Uh, scholars call it the Levant, which is a French word meaning sunrise. Um, the indigenous peoples who lived there before the Israelites, the oldest people we know of, were called Canaan. And um, in future history, they talk about the Phoenicians. If you've ever heard of the Phoenicians mm -hmm. and the Carthaginians, they fought against the Romans. If you guys have ever seen that, I think there's a movie called Hannibal. I don't know if I've seen mm -hmm. the movie, mm -hmm. but Hannibal's about a guy. Uh, Hannibal means Hanbaal, ba uh, Baal, like the Canaanite god Baal. He was a Canaanite. These people didn't call themselves Phoenicians. They were called Phoenicians by the Greeks, but they were Canaanites. And because the Israelites were pushing them out of their land, they left that land and they went and colonized the Mediterranean. And then they went to war with the Romans, and the Romans ended up wiping them out. So that's what happened to the Canaanites. They were the native people. Canaan means lowland. And then Israel came in, as we talked about, and this land became Israel, which means he rules with God. And then when the Roman Empire came in and conquered the land and took it away from Israel, they renamed it Palestine after the Philistines, that other group I talked about last week that were coming in because they did not like the Jewish people. They were really mad at them because they just caused a lot of problems for Rome's dominance over the world. So they changed the name of the land to Palestine, which is why to this day Palestine is, is a conflict. Do we call it Israel? Do we call it Palestine? And so you can see the, the origins of both those things. So this Genesis 1 through 11, this is Genesis 1 through 11, what I believe the world looked like, um, which is all the lands were together in one. Pangea is the name of the science term for it. But the Bible talks about how after the flood, God divided all the lands in the days of Peleg, this guy named Peleg or Peleg. But at this time, the Garden of Eden was probably like right here, which is where the Promised Land is, as you can see. Um, and then that was the rest of the land. Genesis 1 through 11 takes place there. This leads us into humanity's beginning, the story of Paradise Lost. So the recap of Genesis 1 through 11. You guys remember the story there in the garden, the serpent. Um, here's a picture of like what maybe it looked like them walking with God. Here God is portrayed as just this awesome like human figure with like a rainbow over him and like all these stars and stuff. We don't really know what it looked like for God to be walking in the garden. That's just one idea. There's this, the serpent who's tempting them. They're in relationship with God in paradise and the serpent is going to ruin everything. <laughs> they listen to the serpent and don't listen to God and so the serpent gets a hold of human hearts which takes the life out of them and um what this means is that inside of each of us, we are enslaved to sin and death through the serpent, through what happened in Eden when we listened to the serpent. So um, 2 Timothy 2 says, God may give them repentance, talking about those that are lost, leading to the full knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. So this is a huge verse that, that Paul... Paul gives us this huge revelation. 
Because what it's telling us is that everyone who's lost, they think they're doing their own thing. Everyone thinks they're doing their own thing. But the truth is, if you're not following God and doing his will, which we were all created to do, you are actually doing Satan's will, but you just don't know it. And you're a slave to Satan's will. You're doing his will, whether you want to or not. Because his will is just to separate everything from God and just have all this chaos. That's where it leads. And Hebrews 2 says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, God himself likewise also partook of the same in Jesus, that through death he, God, might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. So the serpent got a hold of our hearts at Eden, which sucked the life out of it. And then because of that, we were given dominion. God gave us dominion over the earth. God created the earth. He had all control over it. And he handed it over to us. And he created us out of the earth, out of the dirt of the ground. And he gave us his blessing, which the idea of blessing here, I forgot to grab, I was going to grab a stuffed animal or something. The idea of blessing is a putting on the knees. So the word blessing in Hebrew has the word knee in it, and um, the, the word for knee is connected to this word. And the idea is like raising a child, basically. So you put the baby on your knees. You've ever seen someone bounce a baby on their knees, like this picture here. And then the other idea with it is kneeling down to support and raise up. So like when, like my nephew Ezekiel is so small, to, to get on his level, I have to kneel down and like talk to him like this. And this is the idea in the word of blessing. So God gave us his blessing, and we see this very parental, fatherly connotation. So he's making us his sons and daughters. He's our father, all in that word blessing. And so God gives us dominion over the earth as his sons and daughters. And our purpose is to serve and protect the earth. We talked about that in Genesis, how he put us in Eden to serve and protect the paradise that God created. And we do this only through God's continual presence, him being with us to raise us and show us the ways to go, and his parenting us. So here's just some portrayals of Jesus walking in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. There's Jesus helping Adam up after he creates him. And Jesus, uh, we don't know what God looked like, but God walked, literally walked in a bodily form with Adam and Eve in the garden. And so these are just artists that have the idea of that as Jesus being the one who does that. Then we fall for the serpent's trap, and the serpent gets control of our hearts, the things that we love, the things that drive us. And then through that, the serpent is able to have control over the whole world, which is why the Bible says... The whole world, in 1 John 5, lies in the evil one. That is the Greek. So it literally says in Greek, in the evil one. The whole world lies in the evil one. However, the Bible also says in Psalm 24, the earth is Yahweh's and all its fullness. So how can this be? It seems like a contradiction, or it could. It's because the earth refers to, I believe, the created material and physical stuff that God established in his truth. The earth is God's creation. The world, on the other hand, is a spiritual sinful system, or these spiritual sinful systems, of humanity's false worship that leads to hearts that craft imaginations, that become images, idols, ideals, icons, symbols, cultures, and nations that are separate from God and his holiness. That is the world. Make sense? Okay. The world is the serpent's manipulation. The earth is God's creation. So, God is still in control of everything that's happening. However, because the serpent rules over our hearts and what we love, because we welcome him into our lives, through the sin in us, we still have dominion over the earth. God gave it to us. He didn't give it to the serpent. But through the things we love, the serpent has dominion over, over the earth through us. Does that make sense? So it's not. That's why the whole world lies in the evil one, and Jesus calls Satan the ruler of this world. Okay. But God promised that he would send a seed of the woman 
which is the Messiah, the first Messianic prophecy to crush the serpent's head. And here we have some pictures of that happening. And that happens through the cross when Jesus dies on the cross. But in the meantime, in our story here, talking about the Old Testament, the serpent is behind the scenes, exerting his influence, wrapping himself all around the world. Still at large. Still at large. <laughs> and he is the angel of death. He's death itself, really, coming to, he, he eats the dust, right? It's, it says in Genesis 3, we talked about, you are dust, but the serpent eats the dust. So he's the one who's, who's eating us, the angel of death. And so this, I love this picture because this is kind of the state of humanity lost in sin. We're just dropped into this vast darkness of water. And underneath is the serpent just waiting to devour us. Though we don't see him yet, we're just in this fall, the state of falling. And we need God to come grab us and lift us up. So the story continues with Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel right away. And we see that the serpent's influence causes violence and bloodshed on the earth with Cain and Abel. Bloodshed, you got red hands. You ever heard the saying, caught red-handed? Mm -hmm. Do you guys know blood. what that means? Or Yeah, the idea is that you have blood on your hands, so that's mm -hmm. why you're caught red-handed. Mm -hmm. So in Genesis, it talks about after we're lost from Eden and separated from God, bloodshed just multiplies all over the earth. So much so that we can't even worship God because when we try to, we get blood. It's a picture of blood all over the Bible. Because we have blood on our hands. We can't even lift our hands without blood on them. Praise God. Now, then, to make things worse, we have the sons of God, the fallen angels. The angels that leave their station, they take all these human wives and they produce these giants who start killing even more and multiplying bloodshed even more. So the earth is very sick in this case and it's covered with blood and so god sees that the earth is threatened by humanity and he decides i need to act humanity is being a tyrant over the earth because the giants even though yes they're only half human they're still human and they're terrorizing the earth so god needs to do something it wasn't just the giants too cain's descendants were very evil on their own even without the giants the giants just sped things up <laughs> it was way worse so earth is threatened and Earth is treated as a woman in danger, too, in the Bible, um, called she and her. I talked about that before. Not to overdo the point, because I'm not trying to be like, lead anyone astray or anything. But I do want to mention that, because I think it's significant. God loves the Earth. So Genesis 6.13 says, Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come to my face. And the end of all flesh, in Jewish tradition, this is a euphemism for death, which is the serpent. So the serpent has come to my face, for the earth is filled with violence because of men. And look, I'm about to destroy them with the earth. So I believe behind the scenes here, based on the tradition and based on a lot of other things, that Satan was basically asking, hey, can I kill everybody on earth? Because they're just filling the world with bloodshed and violence. Even though he's the reason that's happening. Mm -hmm. He's a hypocrite, and he's pretending to be righteous. Like, look what they're doing to your earth, God. And so he asks, can I kill everybody? And God says, yes, but God chooses Noah to save humanity. So Noah builds the ark, and God becomes the shield Oops, the shield of humanity. Um, so you guys have probably seen the Star of David before, but in Hebrew it's Magen David, or David. And it means literally shield of David, not Star of David. And yes, originally this was a pagan symbol, but... It's not the point right now. In Judaism today, they view it, why it's the symbol of Israel and all the stuff, is it's because God is their shield. Like God said, I am your shield to Abraham in Genesis 15, 1. So God is the shield, the protector of humanity. So even though God has allowed Satan through this bow to aim weapons and shoot down arrows, the rain on humanity, which will wipe out all the violence and bloodshed, God is the shield of humanity and saves humanity through Noah and his family and all the animals with him. And he gives the rainbow as the sign afterwards to guarantee his protection. Now, here's Pangea, the, what I believe the earth looked like in Genesis 1 through 11 before, or excuse me, in Genesis, before the flood, basically, Genesis 1 through 9-ish, um, or 8. 
but there was this canopy of water around it. I talked about that before. I just wanted to show a visual of it. And basically in the flood, God broke it. All this water came flooding onto the earth. Hmm. And so we have all the water covering all over the earth, baptizing the earth, and cleansing it of all the bloodshed. But afterwards, everyone except Noah and his family dies, and God gives a sign of a rainbow of protection that he will never destroy the whole earth and all humanity again. And he, because man is wicked from his youth, and God's going to come up with another way to save humanity. So the idea in the rainbow in Hebrew is literally a bow, which is God is basically setting the bow instead of aiming it at the earth like it was originally. God is now aiming it at heaven so that now God will bring judgment on the heavens. But in order to do that, God also has to allow the judgment to fall on himself, which is what happens with Jesus on the cross, because he is the king of kings and the God of God. So Jesus dies on the cross for us, and in that act, it takes away all the power from all these other sons of God that were corrupt and turned away and deceived. It takes away the power from the serpent and the serpent that's in us as well. And these verses, um, I don't know why that's cut off there, but it says, God made the Messiah who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And it says, it will be in that... Oh, sorry, guys, I... It's like cut off there. So it will be in that day that Yahweh will punish the host of the heights on high. And this is in Isaiah. So he's talking about he's going to punish the wickedness that's in heaven. So there is wickedness in heaven. And then Ephesians 6, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies. So that all that idea is in the rainbow, the symbol of the rainbow. Now, I just want to comment on something um, that's kind of interesting. In modern Judaism, uh, if you are a non-Jew in the more stricter forms of Judaism, they believe that the only thing God will judge you by is these things called Noahide laws, seven Noahide laws, and they come from Noah after the story. And um, I just thought this was interesting, so that's why I'm sharing it with you. But um, So the first one is... Do not disrespect God's oneness. Know the only creator of all and his desire for goodness. It's the meaning. And so do not curse your creator. Never speak anything negative to or about God. Do not murder. Each individual human life contains the worth of the entire universe. I love that. Because wow. basically when they gave these, it's, it's from a, the leading like Judaism website, Chabad, that, that Eric goes to. Um, but that they clarify it, and sometimes, that's why I like reading Jewish articles sometimes, because they have a certain perspective that others don't have sometimes. I really like that. So, because each individual human life contains the worth of the entire universe, when you're murdering a person, you're destroying the whole universe. It's, that's their, what they say. Very interesting. Um, do not eat any part of animals while they're still alive. Doesn't seem very hard to do. But the reason is, is that you're causing pain to a living being, and that's cruel. Um, five is do not steal. It is wrong to profit at the unwilling and unfair expense of someone else. Six is control your sexuality. It is most holy when used properly and most destructive when abused. So it's, they would say, and I disagree with this partially, but sexuality is the most holy thing that God has given us. Um, but when you abuse it, it's also the thing that can destroy more than anything else. That might be, I don't know, I won't, I won't get into that right now. But <laughs> that's too much to cover. But um, it can be abused, they say. Now there is, on this point, I put a star there, because different types of Judaism are going to disagree on what does it mean to control your sexuality. Some forms of Judaism are against homosexuality and stuff like that and trans stuff and stuff like that. But then other types of Judaism are totally welcoming of that as long as there's consent, you know, more liberal. So control your sexuality. Well, what does that mean? You know, it could, and so there's debates within Judaism about that. Um, Judaism has more acceptance usually toward peaceful disagreement than Christianity does. Um, now, seven is established courts to bring justice to the world. 
Justice brings harmony and stability to the universe. So the idea here is that God gave these seven laws to all humanity. So God will judge us all by this. And, but Jewish people, they would say, will be judged by 613 laws that come from Moses' Torah, which are much more difficult to remember and to do. That's way more overwhelming. Which is why, as I'm going to talk about a little later, they discourage people from wanting to become Jews. Because they believe when you become a Jew, you say, well, seven's not enough. I want 613. And that's one of the reasons they discourage non-Jews from becoming Jews. <laughs> okay. So, the Near East, where the Bible story is taking place. Now, from this point in the story, it's not the whole world anymore. It's zoomed in on this area. This area right here. The promised land and the area surrounding it. The Ark, Noah's Ark, lands on Mount Ararat over here. From there, they move down and they build the Tower of Babel. And then from there, God scatters them all over the earth. And this just kind of shows where each person went. Noah had three sons, so his three sons and their tribes went in all different directions. Wow, dang, dude. They made all the different different types of people. Yep, they made everybody they made else. Black, white, and Asian. Everybody who's alive today comes from Noah's sons. So I don't know what Noah's sons looked like. I don't know what their skin color was. Um, I will comment briefly. Um, I'm not 100% a fan of this chart because back in the day... There's a lot of racism around this. So, so this is true in terms of like the way they were spread out. However, notice how they colored the arrows. This one's white, yeah. this one's yellow, and this one's black, right, yeah. or brown. Because back in the day, they said everybody who came from Ham was a, was a black person, an African. Everybody who came from Shem was an Asian, and everyone who came from Japheth was a European. And they said that. And honestly, it's not that simple. No. It's Number one, it's not that simple. You have no they, Middle Eastern people there. People from Ham went over here and here. People from Shem went over here and here. It, it, it's, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. It's just over time, yeah. like, the, the, like the, the atmosphere. People groups like, don't happen until a long time. Yeah, because their skin gets darker over time. Right? They all have the same yeah. father. It's like, oh, this one looks way different. I know, than yeah. This I, it, there would be a black Asian <laughs> white sun. Like, right. that's so weird. Yeah, like, there's no, something right. wrong here. Where, based on where you move, the sun is a lot hotter here, so you're going to have to have darker skin. Yeah. The sun is... Is hotter here, but there's also cold here, so their skin's gonna change. There's barely any sun here, so you're gonna need more melt, uh, not melatonin. You're gonna need more um, melatonin to sleep, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you know what I mean. Melanin. melanin, thank you. That's why I said melatonin. Um, so you're well, gonna need melanin, more. Melanin is what makes you darker, though, right? That's what I'm saying, but mm -hmm. for vitamin D, because our skin needs vitamin D. Mm -hmm. So we became whiter over here because you need more vitamin D in our skin. And if you notice, today, Jews. We haven't gotten this far in the story yet, but they're scattered all over the world. And there's Jews of basically every physical appearance. There's mm -hmm. black Jewish people. There's brown Jewish people. There's, there's Asian Jews. I, you guys probably didn't know this, but there's Jews in Japan and China. It's really interesting. I didn't even know that until recently. I, I, just I, that recently. I, I would love for you to like find pictures of these examples. I, I have a picture. You can literally type it on Google. 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 Come on. But um, anyway, yeah, and then of us. course I, there's... White, white Jewish people, too. So there's Jewish people of all. And why? Because based on where they moved, in only 100, 200 years, their skin color started to change based on their mm -hmm. climate that they were. So, mm -hmm. so uh, everyone's scattered after the Tower of Babel. And then we get um, this guy named Terah. The story zooms in on him through Shem. He's from Shem. But Terah had this whole family, including Abraham, his son. But God calls... Uh, here's another picture of Terah's genealogy here. Um, so God calls this man Terah to, um, to basically, it's, it seems like God either calls him or leads him to start moving from his homeland to the land of Canaan. But before that happens, Terah is born in this place called Ur, which is right near the Tower of Babel, maybe right in like the area of Babel. And in that place, Terah has these three sons, Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran dies in Ur. So he's dead. But that was his firstborn son, by the way. I, know, I don't know why it shows it this way, but Haran was his firstborn son. But he left behind three children. One of them being Lot. Iska, as a side note, is where the name Jessica comes from. Very popular English name Jessica it comes from the same Iska, one of Haran's children. It was a daughter. Um, Milka, another daughter, 
married her uncle in the war. So like Game of Thrones, House of Dragons. I don't know. They this, they did this back then, and it wasn't just uh, these people. It was a lot of people married within cousins. And stuff Everyone like in Old Testament, I think. They did. Um, well, and then Abraham. Your uncle is a little different than marrying your cousin, though. Yeah. Hey, you're my dad's brother. <laughs> Perfect. Abraham married Sarah. And then, I can see that happening back then. So after Haran dies, Terah takes his whole family that's left here, and they start moving. Oops. They start moving from Ur. This is where Ur is, where the Tower of Babel was. Over here to Haran. Interestingly, it's named the same name that his son had. So he finds this town that's named the same name that his son had, and Terah just settles there. And so we don't know why, but but Abraham's there with him. The whole family's there with him. <laughs> but Terah just settles there with the family, and then Nahor and these his wife and uh, other niece that he didn't marry, <laughs> they, they settle there. Nephews and, they, and brothers in laws at the same time. They have their whole family here. And this so, is the original Hillbillies. Uh, the, the, the wives. <laughs> that's the line of the hill. That's where the, the people from Tennessee and all those people go. There is uh, Nahor's. That's, that's much toward the more of the Nahor's. <laughs> Sarah is, um, wait, what? Is it, is it Sarah, Sarah? No, Sarah was one of Terah's. Yeah, Sarah oh, was all. Yeah, really Sarah was also Abraham's half sister. That's right. That's right. That's right. That does show that on there. Oh, but yeah. through a different, yeah. through a through different, different, different woman. woman. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, yeah. So we're not gonna get too off on that. It's a lot of Game of Thrones stuff. Yeah. The Bible says that Sarah was Abraham's half sister, so there was another mother in there somewhere. Anyway. If you notice, Abraham had Isaac and Jacob, right? Well, the wives of Isaac and Jacob come from the Horus family line here. So they end up marrying, like, cousins and stuff, basically. Okay, so Terah... Oh. That's the best one. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to go fast because I'm using the power of my... Okay. <laughs> so so um, Terah dies in Haran. And then this begins Israel's beginnings. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the three men that are the origins of Israel, the patriarchs. So Genesis chapter 1 through 50. So Abraham now is called by God to leave Haran and leave everybody else, all the rest of his family here, with Sarah and Lot. So Lot goes with him. And to go to the land of Canaan. So Abraham moves from Haran to this specific place in Canaan called Shechem. And this is where God appears to him. And so we don't know how God appears to him, but it says in, in some bodily form, God physically appeared to Abraham. He saw him. This is the name of God in Hebrew, by the way. This is Paleo-Hebrew. So this would have been Hebrew in the time of like David, maybe Moses as well. But all, all of Hebrew before the Babylonian exile. I'm going to find anyway. you guys a meme that my friends posted about this. But keep <laughs> so it's in Shechem. That's why Shechem becomes spiritually significant. That is where... God first appeared to Abraham and he told him, I will give you this land. I will give you this land in Shechem. He didn't specify the borders yet, but he said, look all around and I'll give you all this land. So he's looking all around in Shechem. And um, this is another portrayal of uh, maybe he looked like Jesus. We don't know what God looked like, but he appeared in some bodily form. So this is a map of the journeys of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, color-coded. So the red is Abraham. So Abraham was in Ur with Terah and the rest of the family. They moved all the way up here to Haran, and then that's where Terah died. But Abraham continued the journey all the way down here into the Promised Land, and then sometimes there was famine, so he had to go down into Egypt, and then he would go back, and the red is Abraham. Dang, dude, that people like years. Oh, yeah, he... Like he, 25 years of his life was the whole journey before he has before he has Isaac. Oh my God. So he's doing all these journeys from 75 to 100 years old. He's an old man. Jeez. And his wife's old too. But they're doing this by faith to see the faith of Abraham. Now in Genesis 15, God clarifies the borders. I talked about this before, but these are the specific borders of the promised land. So um, it includes Africa, on this end, Europe on this end, and then Asia as well. So the significance of this also is that back then, all trade and interaction with other countries happened through roads that were in this area. Whoa. So everybody over here was coming this way, everybody over here was coming this way, Whoa. everybody over here was coming this way. So the idea is that God is trying to make his name known in this land, but this is also, I believe, where the Garden of Eden was. 
So significant for many reasons. Um, here's the scene of Genesis 15 where that's God there appearing in some bodily form to Abraham saying, I will make your descendants like the stars of heaven. And back then with no light pollution, when we were camping and stuff, you can see millions of stars. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that I'm going to multiply it. Abraham couldn't even have one son. But God is promising he's going to make him like the stars in the sky. And then we see the prophecies to Jesus on the cross. So there's the borders again. Um, now, Lot, his wife died. because he, he ended up separating from Abraham and settling in the city of Sodom. Well, he had two daughters, but his wife... Uh, was turned into a pillar of salt because she disobeyed the angel's command. But because of that, he had no sons, so his legacy was going to die. This is going to connect to our story in the book of Ruth as well. It's a big deal for a family legacy to die in the Bible. You don't want that to happen. You don't want a man's name to be blotted out. So his daughter's are like, we need to give our father sons. So let's get him drunk and have sex with him. And, have, and so, so they, they do that. They do that. So gross. Yeah, there's a lot of incest in the beginning of the Bible. The fact that the, do <laughs> the, fact that the daughters wanted it, though, is so sick to me. Like. Well, they didn't want it because – don't think of it like – I mean, I don't know. I can't know their hearts. But the motive in that culture was we need to give our father sons because we love our father and he needs sons. He has no sons. His name is going to die out. He needs sons. So we have to do this. Also, it's not like we want to do this. There's a second piece of this too. Um, they had got out, out of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. They just watched all this fire come down and destroy this whole area. And there was a prophecy that the world would be destroyed by fire. That would be the next country it's destroyed. It would be by fire, not by water. So... Uh, these daughters probably thought that the world has just been destroyed and we're the only people left on earth. Oh, okay. So it's like, well, crap. <laughs> what do we do now? Yeah, I guess you're right. I mean, yeah. Yeah, they were in a cave, too. Yeah, so they were yeah. living in a cave at this time. They had no... This could be it. We could be it. <laughs> because Lot didn't have a lot of faith, just on points of the story. Because the angel told him they could go to another city, but he didn't trust the angel. They were probably like, it's not like no one's ever going to hear about this. <laughs> <laughs> we're the, we're the it's not like anyone's ever going to hear about this. <laughs> Meanwhile, to, God riding the bus. Yeah. <laughs> they had to do so, it in the game. Focusing it back in. Moses is lying. I do need to continue. So Lot, <laughs> through these daughters, Lot has two sons. One is named ben -Ami. The Ammonites become a whole nation through him, through this. And Moab become another nation. And in the book of Judges, last week, we talked about how Moab and the Ammonites were two of the main enemies of the people of Israel. They were trying to kill them and fighting over the land with them. Mm -hmm. So remember that name specifically, Moab. Remember Moab comes from Lot. Because that's going to be important in root. So, Abraham now is God's chosen covenant partner. What's his bloodline? Well, it comes from Shem, so you could call it Semitic. That's where anti-Semitic comes from. Semitic comes from Shin. You could call him a Hebrew, because Hebrew comes from Eber, and it refers to people who travel a lot. But everybody on here is a Hebrew. All these people are Hebrews. So, but Abraham, what makes him different is that God has chosen to give his covenant, the covenant that goes back to the promised seed of the woman that will defeat the serpent. That covenant is given to Abraham. And that's the significance of Abraham. It has nothing to do with his blood or where he's from. And we'll see this because in the future history, looking back now, people will consider Abraham Jewish. Why? Was he Jewish by blood? Well, no. It had nothing to do with blood at all. It's because all these people, by blood, they're related to Abraham, but they're not chosen to carry God's covenant. And that makes them Gentiles. So a different, different perspective on that. So Lot and Moab... Um, our family with Abraham by flesh, not by faith. Lot and his son Moab, and the future nation of Moab, which is where Ruth is going to come from, were all genetically related to Abraham. They could trace the line back to him. But in terms of flesh and blood, they were Abraham's family. They were also Hebrews, but they did not share Abraham's faith. Therefore, they were cut off from the chosen covenant people of God. Same with Hagar, Ishmael. Midian, etc. Their family of Abraham by faith, by flesh, Tough. but not by faith. They were genetically related to Abraham, though. But they're cut off from, they're not chosen to carry God's covenant, so they're not part of that then. Now Paul, then, from this idea, talks about how 
It's by faith and not by flesh. Paul says in Galatians, Just as Abraham trusted God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, so know that those who are of faith, those are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, expecting that God defends the nations, or Gentiles, to translate Gentiles or nations either way, but it's all other non-Jewish people. So in the scripture, expecting that God defends the nations by faith, proclaim the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. And we read that scripture before. Genesis 12. So then those who are of faith are blessed with the faithful Abraham. So the idea is that all of us are sons of Abraham who share the faith of Abraham. By faith, not by flesh. That's Paul. So, but religion today, and this is true, I'm realizing, because we talked about this before, but I changed my mind. Things have changed a lot, just because of culture and history and stuff like that. Today, religion is by flesh. It's not by faith, in truth. Both Judaism and Christianity today can be viewed as connected to families, to bloodlines, and to nations. Oh, my family's been Christian for generations, and now I'm going to think of it. It's, it's a bloodline, <laughs> you know. We're a Christian family. Um, in the beginning of both faiths, both of the faiths, so both Judaism and Christianity, this was not so. It had nothing to do with the bloodline. Um, Judaism was by faith. Um, God's chosen role for everyone is unique. So God still has a role for all these people. They're just not chosen to carry the covenant in the story. Okay, so that brings us to, oops, that brings us to Isaac and Jacob. So Isaac is then chosen to carry the covenant, and then Jacob and Rebecca with him because Rebecca becomes his wife. And then Jacob is chosen to carry the covenant. That's the blue, all of God's chosen covenant partners. So it's about who's going to carry God's covenant. And so we have Jacob's story. He deceives Esau twice, right? He makes Esau give him his inheritance for, or birthright for a bowl of stew. <laughs> That's a picture of that happening. Yep. I like this because you can see Esau's a man man and Jacob's this like clean shaven, like girly boy. Because he was, he's portrayed that way. He's portrayed as like not like a, a man's man. Esau's more that way, but Jacob is not. So he puts the sheepskin on himself and he deceives his blind father, Isaac into giving him the blessing and passing the covenant on to him. So he's forced to run away because Esau wants to kill him. His parents are devastated, Isaac and Rebekah. And then in the future, he's going to wrestle with God. But in the meantime, as he's running away, he goes to sleep at this area called Bethel, where he lays his head on this rock and he has this dream where he sees heaven open and Yahweh's at the top, God's at the top, and all these angels are going up and down on some sort of ladder or stairway at Bethel, so he names the place Bethel, meaning house of God, and it becomes a holy site in the future, although never as significant as other holy sites, but still very significant. Okay, so then Jacob has all these other women, and he has the 12 sons, and they become God's chosen covenant partners, the beginning of the Israelites. You can trace it back to Abraham, and there's all the Israelites, like I showed you guys last week, from the women. In the meantime, uh, Jacob comes back. Oh, and Isaac, notice how Isaac's journey, that's the purple. Such a minimal role in the story. He like barely moves. But Jacob, like Abraham, he goes all the way up back to Haran. That's where he gets, uh, when the whore was, that's where he gets Rachel. Um, and then he comes all the way back down here, and Jacob goes all over the place as well. Shechem is still an important site here. Um, but I also want to point out the Jabbok River. So the place where God wrestled with Jacob and changed his name to Israel, they wrestled all night long, happened <laughs> at the Jabbok River here right by the Jordan River. And that's significant because the Jordan River is a huge theme throughout the Bible story. It's where Jesus is going to be baptized later. It's where Joshua leads the Israelites across to get into the Promised Land. But the first big thing that happens here is... God wrestles with Jacob all night long and changes his name to Israel. So that happens right here by the Jabbok River and the Jordan River near Shechem. Okay, so this is a portrayal of Jacob. That's supposed to be Jacob seeing God in some human form. Some man, he doesn't know who it is actually at first. He's like some, some guy. 
And then he wrestles with him. Uh, I'll, you guys can look at it after I text it to John. He'll put it back on John. But there's a meme about this. I think you guys will find funny. Yeah, I, I would like to see that. <laughs> share it in the... Well, I don't know if it will come through in the chat. but So, Jacob wrestles with God all night long. It's a portrayal of that. And here he's portrayed like Jesus, as you can see. We don't know exactly what it looked like. But he realizes at the end, he gives him the blessing in the name Israel because... Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he lets him go This because the sun's coming up. And he's like, I got to go. It's, we've been wrestling all night. <laughs> so, yeah. It's like, well, I won't let you go because Jacob has him in a headlock unless you bless me. And so he gives him the name Israel. And then he says, well, what is your name? Like, who are you? And he responds, why do you ask my name? And somehow in that interaction, Jacob realizes this is God. And then the guy disappears. And he says, I've seen God and yet I live. So he calls the name of that place Peniel, which means um, face of God, basically. Wow. That's epic. Yeah. It's a crazy story. So that's where Jacob became Israel after wrestling with God all night long in this location near Shechem. It was literally for like eight hours? Yeah. It says from, like, because he sent his family across the river, right? And then he stays there in the east. And before he crosses the river, he wrestles with God. And then he crosses the river into the land. Here's the 12 tribes of Israel again. You've seen this before. I drew it out, but that's uh, another representation of it. This is the story carries out with them. But for right now, they're just sons of Israel. So these 12 sons of Israel, they have this brother Joseph right here, the 11th born through Rachel, the favorite wife. He gets this coat of many colors. They're all jealous. They conspire to try to kill him at first, but then they decide to just sell him into slavery. And so he becomes a slave, but... In Egypt, and then God lifts him up into a position of authority. So that's Joseph there. He now has authority. He's second in command over all Egypt. All the brothers repent. But that's how Israel moves down here into Egypt, specifically in Goshen. That's where they become slaves. So this is Israel's journey now. Quick recap of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua. We already talked about all this. Moses uh, to Joshua in the Promised Land. So Israel goes from 70 people to 2 million. Crazy, miraculous population boom in Goshen. And then they become slaves because the Egyptians are afraid of them. Then God calls Moses at the burning bush. That's once again the name of God. That we don't know how to pronounce it. And uh, in Judaism it's offensive to even try, but I'm not. I think that's offensive that you'd be offended by that. <laughs> anyway, so, right, so Yahweh is how I've been pronouncing it, but we, we don't know. Um, YHWH is how you could write it out in English. Uh, what does this name mean? Well, the question is, what do you need? And the answer is the meaning. I am that. I am. Or I will be that. I will be. Or, in a personal way, who do you need? I am who I am. I will be who I will be. All that is in the meaning. Because Hebrew is a little more flexible than English in certain cases. So then God takes on the gods of Egypt through Moses and in delivering Israel from slavery, revealing himself as a God who saves the lowly and the oppressed and humbles those who are proud. Because Egypt was the greatest nation on earth at this time. Nobody could stop them. And they have up this whole pantheon of gods. So God starts canceling their pantheon one at a time. With each plague that God does, he cancels the whole Egyptian pantheon. So it shows that he... Here. yeah. Canceled. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and he shows that he is the God of gods. He, he is the only one who matters, who has the power. And in the ultimate act, the Egyptians chase after the Israelites. God uses Moses to split the Red Sea like a hallway. The Israelites cross through, and the Egyptians are drowned in the sea. And then God speaks to them on Mount Sinai, as we talked about, calling to all of them from the mountain. But then they say, Moses, go up. So Moses goes up. He gets the stone tablets the Ten Commandments that God spoke to them. And then he gives them instructions to build a tent for Yahweh, right? So here's the tent in their camp in the wilderness, and it says that God's pillar of cloud and fire dwelled in the holy place, and above it the people could see it. And when they walked in the wilderness, they followed this thing all, all the way around. Whenever it left, they packed up camp and went with it. Here is the high priest, what he looked like, by his clothes next to the Ark of the Covenant. This is the first one who is called Messiah. Here's the cross formation that they camped in in the wilderness. Because before, that picture was really close up. 
This is like what it would have looked like from a mountain far away. You get the top and the shape of the cross. And then here's what their wilderness journey looked like from Goshen. They went all the way down to Mount Sinai. And then they went all the way over here and over here and over here. And they, and they wandered all, all That's over. That's really, 39 years. Really, there's more than... Um, this is just probably showing the first journey to the Promised Land. But this is the area they were wandering. The little uh, arrowhead-looking thing. You zoom out on the map. But then from here... They Joshua comes in and they conquer the promised land. So the blue arrow shows the conquest, because they did do battles with Moses, people that they fought against in the wilderness, and then in the east side of the promised land, and then they cross over with Joshua, that's the red, and then they, through Joshua, they take the promised land. Moses commissions Joshua, that's what this is showing, to replace him and lead the people, and then Joshua leads the people across the Jordan River, this significant river that I've been talking about. That's a picture of what it looks like. Uh, more recently, Jordan River. So there's God parts the Jordan River, just like he did for Moses, as another sign. And uh, the people cross over first, the Levites, with the Ark of the Covenant. That's the Levites carrying the Ark. And then Joshua and the rest of the people cross through the Jordan River on dry land, where they begin to conquer Jericho with the help of Rahab. This is Rahab hiding the two spies. And Rahab is a Canaanite woman from Jericho. But she believes, she, she heard about what happened in Egypt, what God did for these slaves. And so because of that, she wants to follow this God and become part of the people of Israel. So she does. She hides the spies, and they save her when the whole rest of the city of Jericho, the walls fall down when the people march around it uh, for seven days, carrying the ark and blowing these trumpets. So that's again the conquest of Joshua. And here's another look at it, um, just the different cities they went to in the order, starting with Gilgal, that's where they set their camp up, I talked about that last week, and then ending in Shechem, but before that, Joshua gives each of the tribes their inheritance, so here's a map of that, each of the colors is one of the 12 tribes of Israel, and these are the different areas of land that each of them inherited, and then he gathers them all together at Shechem, and he says, only worship Yahweh, the only God who's ever been there for you. None of these other gods have done anything for you. You can do whatever you want. You can choose who you serve. But remember, if you choose to serve Yahweh, worship him, you'll have life. If you don't, things are going to go real bad for you. <laughs> and that happens at Shechem. So the same place where God appeared to Abraham. Talked about it before. I also want to mention briefly, there's Shechem up there on this map, Shiloh and Bethel. Shechem, by this time, by the death of Joshua, becomes the semi-official semi political capital of Israel. Shiloh becomes the official spiritual capital. This is where they moved Yahweh's tent. It's settled there in Shiloh, with the Ark of the Covenant. And it's there through the whole story of the Book of Judges in Shiloh. And so this is the holy place. This is basically the Jerusalem of that time, before there was a Jerusalem, because they hadn't conquered Jerusalem yet. And then Bethel was another sacred site that there may have been, they may have built shrines and stuff to Yahweh there, but it was never fully officialized like Shiloh or Jerusalem later. So then we talked about last week judges. Israel rejects their king. And this is just a map showing where each of the judges were active. So Othniel over here, down here in Judah, Ibzan, which may have been Boaz and Bethel, Samson, Ehud, Deborah, Jephthah, We'll see them all on there. What time is it? 10.20. Okay, cool. Ruth's pretty short, so I'm, I'm good. Hope you got it. You guys still with me? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of information today. I'm not normally going to, if I do PowerPoint thing again, I'm just going to show maps for what we're doing, but because I hadn't done this before, I want to show you maps of stuff we covered before because I think visuals help mm -hmm. with yeah. things. Mm -hmm. So these, again, are the judges of Israel. This one shows the territories by color as well that belong to each of the tribes. Um, but then it also shows where the judges are. I like this map better. It's a bit more clear. So, Yahweh is the king of Israel, but the people reject him as their king. And that was the main theme we talked about in Judges last week. But as the people go into suffering, despite the fact that they rejected God, God saves them by lifting up each of these judges. 
And that brings us to the book of Ruth, redemption for the lost. So the book of Ruth happens during the period of Judges. So it is a story within that larger story. And the Bible does this sometimes. Each of the prophets is really like this. It'll give us an overarching story. So this is the big thing that's happening. But then in the midst of this big thing that's happening, there's a small story of just this one person, and this one family that's happening. And so that is the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth is happening during the time of the judges. And the story goes like this. So during the time of Judges, a family from the tribe of Judah in Bethlehem moves to the land of Moab. And they do this because if there's severe famine here. So they're from Bethlehem, a family from Bethlehem. There's severe famine over here. They need food because they're starving. So they move over here. You can follow these arrows on this map from Bethlehem to Moab because the nation of Moab, they were just one, it was just one man, but like Israel, it became a nation. They had food here in Moab. So it was a pagan land. They worshipped other gods. But they just need food. So they leave Bethlehem to go to Moab. Now, interestingly, the head of the household of this family who moves, his name is Elimelech. And Elimelech means God is my king. So this is showing that they were recognizing God as king in some way in this family. But then, when they're in Moab, Elimelech, the head of the household, he dies, leaving his wife, who's named Naomi, and two sons alone in Moab. They're all alone here. Well, then, Naomi's sons take two Moabite wives, two Moabite women to be their wives. They live together for 10 years in Moab before both of Naomi's sons also die without having any children. Tragedy after tragedy. So first she loses her husband here in this foreign land. First, they have to go to a foreign land to get food. Then she loses her husband. Then she loses her two sons, but not before, before her sons die, they take women from Moab. So these women are not even Israelites. They're not even supposed to be with these women, but they were the women in this land. They were Gentile women. So after this, Naomi is left alone in Moab with no family except her two daughters-in-law. And after Naomi learns that Yahweh has given more food back in Bethlehem, she decides to return there from Moab. Naomi urges her daughters-in-law to leave her to stay in Moab and find husbands to start their own families among their own people. So, I'm going to read this section from where it picks up here in the story. So it says, Naomi was left without her two children and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law and returned from the fields of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that Yahweh had visited his people to give them bread. And this is significant because Bethlehem, the city of Bethlehem, means house of bread. House of bread. So she went forth from the place where she was in Moab and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. So they came this way. Now they're leaving from Moab. They cross the river Arnon. Well, they, they get to this place called the river Arnon. And then they're gonna, Naomi's going to continue her journey. But here around the river Arnon, or maybe here, so, somewhere along this way, before they get back to Israel, this scene happens. Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May Yahweh do bonding with you as you have done with the dead and with me. May Yahweh grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, but we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is more bitter for me than for you. 
for the hand of Yahweh has gone forth against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So the two daughters-in-law, they're named. Orpah is one, and then Ruth is the other. Orpah is where the name Oprah comes from. <laughs> Oprah Winfrey was named after this. You didn't know that, so Orpah. Ruth, it says Ruth clung to her. So here's a picture of this. Orpah is there walking away, and Ruth will not leave Naomi alone. She can't stand to see the suffering of this poor old woman. What's going to happen to her? She has no family. She's a woman in those days with no men in her life, had nothing. There's, there's, there's nothing for her but death. Now, this story right here is the story of why it's so hard to convert to Judaism today in the more official, because in the story, um, Naomi is saying, no, no, no. Go back to your land. Go back to where you're from. Be, go back to your own people. You're not supposed to be part of, you know, our people. You, you don't have to be, because Ruth was a Gentile by birth. She was a Moabite. She was not an Israelite. But she wanted to follow Naomi and become part of Naomi's people and serve their God. Um, one of the reasons it's so hard, too, is that they believe in Judaism uh, if a Gentile truly converts to Judaism, they, they literally become a Jew. So it's more than just blood, even, even today, in that aspect of it. So if you become a Jew in Judaism, there's nothing you can do to not be a Jew. It doesn't matter. You can say, I hate God, but I'm an atheist, I'm a Satanist. It doesn't matter. You're still a Jew. They believe you cannot undo it. So for this reason, and because of the story, they believe you should discourage. You should not be a Jew. No. So if somebody says, hey, I want to be a Jew, no, no, no. The, the rabbis are supposed to say no, 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 just like Naomi did, and push Ruth and Orpah away many times so that they don't follow. But Ruth refused to go away. And so in Judaism, Ruth is an example of a true convert because she's like, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to be. And she says here, I love this, that's the scene again, but she says, this is a key line, so, well, in the story, I'll point out. Then Naomi said, Behold, your sister-in-law has returned to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to forsake you in turning back and following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus may Yahweh do to me, and more, if death separates you and me. So she's saying not even death will be able to separate us. So Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, and she said no more to her. Then they both went until they came to Bethlehem. Now this book I've been reading is called Your People Shall Be My People. We're gonna, I'm going to talk about it more when we talk about church history, but because it ties into all this, I believe. But beautiful, beautiful story happening right here. Your people shall be my people. Your God shall be my God. Ruth, the Gentile, becomes part of the people of God, the chosen people. So then they both went until they came to Bethlehem. So they come back to Bethlehem here, or Moab. Bethlehem means house of bread. I already said that. Um, so once again, this is during the time of Judges. So in the time of Judges, this is Bethlehem right here. It's in the territory of Judah, the tribe of Judah. And the judge, or a judge who was a judge there, was named Ibzon. So it's possible that Ibzon, this guy Ibzon, was Boaz, who we're going to meet in the story. Um, so, why do we think it's Boaz? Well, well, first here, let me, let me read point D here. So while working hard, so once they get back, Naomi and Ruth, Naomi's an old woman, but they still need food to eat. So that requires hard work. So basically, Ruth starts working hard to provide for her, both her mother-in-law, Naomi, and herself, and they have no men to help them. But in the process of working hard, Ruth meets this guy named Boaz. And Boaz is a close relative of that guy, Elimelech, who died, Naomi's uh, late husband. So Boaz is impressed with Ruth's hard work, and he gives generously to her. And Naomi explains to Ruth that Boaz 
is an eligible family redeemer. And this is the first major time the word redeemer is used in the Bible. According to Israelite custom. So, in this original context, a redeemer is specifically a man from your family that redeems your family's legacy. So, if the legacy is lost, or it's going to be lost, like, because if there's no more men, there's no more children, sons, the legacy is going to be lost. The redeemer's job is to save that legacy. And Boaz is eligible. Not everybody can be a redeemer. You have to be part of the family. Boaz is eligible. So why is it possible that Boaz may have been this Judge Ibzan? Well, in Ruth 2.1, it says that Boaz was a mighty man of valor. The same phrase is used to describe Gideon in Judges and Jephthah in Judges. They're both called mighty men of valor. Also, the Judge Ibzan lived and died in Bethlehem. Just like Boaz. So there is a possible connection. Boaz might have been this judge in Bethlehem. We don't, we don't know for sure, but I don't know. We don't share the same name, but it's a possibility. So redemption is about restoring what's been lost. Um, sometimes they translate it kinsman redeemer, but it's the idea of reviving or saving the family legacy because it's about to be lost. And remember that that name, Abimelech, means God is my king, showing God as the king of the people. Um, through Boaz and Ruth, at the end of the story, we're going to see that the legacy of God as the king of Israel will continue. So that's the legacy that's at stake here, in a literally meaning of the name Elimelech. If Elimelech dies, the legacy of God is my king dies. And so Ruth, through, with Boaz here, is going to save that legacy. I'll talk about that in a minute. So we're at the end here. So Naomi instructs Ruth how to, oppose, how to propose to Boaz for him to redeem Naomi's family line. Because even though Boaz is eligible, he's eligible in the family to redeem the family, that doesn't mean he still has a choice. He doesn't have to. It would be a right thing to do, but it's not. he doesn't have to do it. Um, so Ruth has to propose to him, basically say, hey, you should take me as your wife. So in the middle of the night, she sneaks into Boaz's room and uncovers his feet. And yes, it's possible that this is a sexual idiom that she was trying to like get him sex. It's possible. So I will, I will mention that. I don't want to like hover on it too much. Bible days were Bible days, you know, in the Old Testament. Old Testament is Old Testament. So things happen that, that aren't always what, up to our standards in the modern day Christian ethics and like stuff like that. But it was just very real. It's very, you know, Game of Thrones. It's very just raw and like this is just how it is. She's trying to get a man's interest. Um, so demonstrating her interest in his redemptive role. So Boaz agrees to redeem Ruth if a close relative agrees to give Ruth to Boaz. Because there's another closer relative, but, and he had to agree, no, I don't want to redeem the family line, you can do it. So basically, Boaz, the story ends, he goes to this closer relative. Because um, it's not just Ruth that he would be getting, he'd also be getting Naomi's land, Boaz himself. But Boaz was part of the family, so he's still redeeming the legacy through Naomi and through Ruth. Um, so the other close uh, relative says yes, and they do this exchange where Boaz becomes the official redeemer of Naomi's and Elimelech's family. Well, so they Boaz, trade sandals or something? yeah, it's a sandal. Yeah, they, they trade sandals. It's an interesting exchange. Um, so Boaz redeems Naomi's family line and their inheritance through Ruth, a process which eventually leads to the birth of David, who will be the most important king of Israel. So not only does he redeem Boaz and Ruth together, they redeem Naomi's family line, the legacy of God is my king. But without them and their union, David never would have been born. He's going to be the greatest king of Israel of all time. Um, so it says here in Ruth 4, 
the scriptures on the bottom. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and Yahweh granted her conception and she gave birth to a son. Then the women said to Naomi, blessed is Yahweh who has not left you without a redeemer today. And may his name be proclaimed in Israel. May he also be to you a returner of your soul and a supporter of your gray hair. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. And then it says at the end, Boaz became the father of Obed through Ruth. Obed became the father of Jesse. And Jesse became the father of David. And we see here, not just here in Ruth, but notice that God does not care about any blood but the blood of Jesus, ultimately. Because each of these women, Tamar, who produced this whole line of Judah, and was Judah's daughter-in-law because he was being wicked, but she was righteous. I didn't go over that story, but she was a Canaanite woman. She was not an Israelite. Rahab was a Canaanite woman, and she was Boaz's mother. I forgot to mention that in the story, but we learned that. And then Ruth is a Moabite woman by birth, but it's not about flesh. It's about faith. And David has this whole legacy, which if you're looking at it by the flesh... Who's David? Like, what, what's his legacy? not pure. He's not a pure blooded Israelite. But look at what he does for Israel. So, yeah, here's the last two slides. So, redemption for Job, just another example of reviving the family legacy. Remember in Job, he lost his whole family except his wife. But Job has this cool statement in Job 19 where he says, As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. And he's talking about God as his redeemer. And after the last, he will rise up over the dust, even after my skin, which has been, which they have cut off. Yet from my flesh, I will view God, whom I on my side will view, and whom my eyes will see, and not another. Job trusted God to redeem his family legacy, and that's what God does at the end of Job's story. God redeems his family, reviving Job's legacy on the earth. But Jesus... He is related to all humanity. That's why God became a man. Because to be a redeemer, you have to be related. You have to be an eligible family member. And so humanity lost their legacy through the serpent. But Jesus is the Messiah, fully God and fully human. In him, God is the redeemer of every human family that was lost or broken in all of history. Jesus redeems the scattered Jewish people, bringing them home. He redeems the lost and mixed tribes of northern Israel. We haven't talked about that yet, but Israel's going to be in the north. They're all going to be lost among the Gentiles and the nations. Jesus is redeeming the royal, lost royal kingdom of David, because who knows who's related to David now, like David now that's been lost. Jesus is redeeming the priestly heritage of the Levites. Once again, we can confirm that some people are Levites, but we don't know. Jesus is redeeming the prophetic legacy of Moses. And Jesus is redeeming the lost families of all nations, going all the way back to Noah and to Adam. He's a Jewish man who can trace his descent back to Adam, and he's reviving his family legacy, because he is now one of us. He's part of the family. And his redemption began with his life, death, and resurrection, and also with him pouring out the Holy Spirit on all flesh. And so this is the Bible story of redemption that we can see from the book of Ruth. I know it was kind of long today, but thank you guys. I hope you... It was good, though. Yeah. yeah. A lot on that, so... Lord, thank you for being our Redeemer. Thank you that you live, that you're active in our lives. There's not a single moment that goes by that you're not with us. We draw our attention to you, Lord. We break away all the distractions. That we may find our fulfillment in you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen.